the other things that the, uh, the center is doing and encourage you to uh, come and sample some of our other events. Um, the, the, the Center for the Humanities here at FIU is, um, its, its central aim is to facilitate conversations on the humanities with, with the uh, uh, greater South Florida community. Uh, as part of it, we're, we sponsor events like the one tonight, a uh, stage reading of a play entitled Collaborators by uh, Richard Schwartz, Professor Emeritus of English, dealing with uh, and, um, and, uh, Arthur Miller, Eliza Kazan, and issues of the Cold War. Uh, it'll be at 7 o'clock in the Wertheim Performing Arts Complex of Black Box Theater. It's free and open to the public. Uh, there's an event that, that is coming in the fall to the Coral Gables Museum, which we're most uh, excited about. Uh, the Center, the Exile Studies Program, and the English Department are the, the primary sponsors, along with the Coral Gables Museum, of an exhibition uh, entitled Beyond Swastika and Jim Crow, which will be uh, at, in Coral Gables for three and a half months. It focuses on the experiences of uh, German academics mostly Jewish, German Jews, but not exclusively, who left Germany shortly before World War II uh, seeking asylum. And because they weren't Albert Einstein, they, they and, and because there was uh, a great deal of overt anti-Semitism in American universities at the time, it was very difficult for them to find employment. Uh, schools, traditionally black colleges and universities South was delighted to uh, to provide places for uh, for these men and women, and uh, there a partnership that lasted for decades developed from this. Uh, the ex the exhibit traces the relationship between the the, the students and the uh, teachers uh, who who are, are going through uh, the, 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 who left the turmoil of Germany and are going through a very tumultuous period of the civil rights movement beginning in the early 50s through the 60s uh, in the South and, and indeed across the country. Um, we have a number of programs related to that uh, over the over the fall, and I it would I'd eat up too much of the speaker's time if I tried to enumerate on them. But I hope you will, uh, uh, if you're on the, the center mailing list, keep an eye out for our announcements. If you're not, Please count, uh, contact the center, and we'll put you on the mailing list and, and uh, let you uh, let you know what we're doing. But right now, it's a uh, it's a, a great pleasure, as I said, to uh, to welcome you to Re Re Revolution in Translation, and uh, to uh, thank Professor Cavioli for the opportunity to uh, to be a co-sponsor. <laughs>
And as part of WAC's mission, as you know, we have, we are an interdisciplinary center. Right? We're devoted to research, uh, outreach, and a number of other activities uh, related to uh, the interdisciplinary study of Latin America and the Caribbean. It's another commitment that we have. So whether it's on history, or literature, or politics, uh, et cetera, or the languages, literature, arts, um, and even the physical sciences, we're, we're going to be involved in kind of in our involvement. Let me tell you a little bit about the choreography of how we do this. So we have a, a keynote speaker uh, that I'll be introducing in a little bit. But first, we're going to have my two colleagues come up and give you uh, a few remarks, about 10 or 15 minutes each, providing a little context to what happened in that March day of 1964. And so let me, I'll introduce them uh, both, uh, one after the other, and then I'll come back and introduce uh, our speaker, which I haven't had the pleasure of <laughs> uh, First up, uh, Dr. Okezi Otobo, some of you already know her, of course. She is an assistant professor of history and a core faculty member of the um, African and African Diaspora Studies program. She uh, received her MA in Latin American Studies and PhD in History from Georgetown University. She is and she works uh, uh, on social history, specifically on uh, peoples of African descent and the politics of gender in uh, Brazil, 20th century Brazil. And she's currently in the final stages of completing her first book, uh, Progressive Mothers, Better Babies, Race, Public Health, and State of Brazil, 1950 to 1945. Next, I'll introduce Professor Nicola Brioli, the most important person in this room today. He <laughs> uh, is Assistant Professor of Portuguese in the Department of uh, Foreign Modern Languages at FIU. He's also currently working on his first book length manuscript on Brazilian coming of age novel. He has been a wonderful colleague to have, and as I said, the person responsible for this. It would not have happened without his support, enthusiasm, and work. So thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. are very brief. Uh, obviously, we know in 10 minutes I can only touch the surface of what is a very complex issue that, as Dr. Moore just um, yeah, explained, is being reinterpreted and rethought more than ever in this year of 2014. So I'll make very brief comments um, in a just very short presentation that I've titled March 31st to April 1st, 1964, the first 48 hours of a revolutionary democratic dictatorship. March 31st, 1964 was a Tuesday. The 48 hour period between that Tuesday and the end of Wednesday, April 1st, witnessed the deposition of President João Goulart, president popularly known as Django, and the beginning of 20 years of an authoritarian military regime. The coup had been several days in the planning. That Tuesday morning, General Olympio Mordel Filho dispatched a column of tanks from the state of Minas Gerais set on the seizure of the old presidential palace in Rio de Janeiro and the forcible ouster of President Lula. From Rio, many held out hope that support for democratic process would also come from within the military through troops stationed in the state of Sao Paulo. Ultimately, no Paulista fac military faction stepped forward to protect the administration. And at noon, President Lula hastily departed for Brasilia to try to regroup. While some close advisors urged armed response, the president could find no uh, sufficient military support even in his home state of Rio Grande do Sul, where he arrived by late afternoon that same day. Seeing no other alternatives, and rather than plunge Brazil into armed conflict, the president left for exile in Uruguay. The following morning, Wednesday, April 1st, the Carioca Daily Jornal do Brasil ran the headline Sao Paulo stands by Minas and announces a march to Rio against Lula. But by Wednesday morning, the die had been cast. Warfare proved unnecessary. That same night, 
President of the Senate, Artem Moram Angelaji, declared Brazil's highest office vacant. Under pressure and using the constitutional requirement that sitting presidents receive congressional permission before leaving the country, Angelaji declared Goulart's tenure void and provided an opening for the new regime of military rule. The trail of events and ideas that set the stage for the deposition were years in the making. Django himself ascended to the presidency under unusual circumstances. <coughs> His predecessor unexpectedly resigned in 1961, leaving Vice President Goulart to step into the role of Brazil's chief executive. Various rural, labor, and student organizations were active across Brazil at the time, pressing for economic, educational, and social reforms in their unequal and fracturing nature, nation. By 1963, inflation was out of control as well. The inequalities and frustrations that these uh, students and others voice long preceded the 1960s, however. But in this context, Goulart introduced a platform of national reform, which he called Hethomajibaz, base reforms. Base reforms would include land redistribution, the nationalization of industries, increasing the minimum wage, increasing access to public universities, eliminating illiteracy, which was at 40% in Brazil at that time, and extending the right to vote to enlisted men and to illiterate Brazilians. From right of center, however, many looked upon Goulart's promise of reforms as a dangerous precedent. They feared the triumph of the left, the popularity of a president and a party who addressed the long-standing structural problems of poverty, of land tenure, and of exclusion. They worried that Goulart would not be able to control those to the far left, and that his reforms were just a veneer for a radical left revolution. So those are some long-term trends. More immediately, Brazil's fragmented political landscape reached a crisis in the weeks preceding the coup. The, coup. the political battle intensified in March 1964 as both left and right became more radicalized and extremely reactionary. During that final month of March 1964, that back and forth between supporters and opponents of Goulart's administration devolved into what I'm calling a political theater. On March 13, Goulart and his allies staged a massive rally in Rio de Janeiro in support of his Hiboma Shibazi. Public displays of support might tip the debate in Congress, which was unwilling to pass many of the president's reforms. And the March 13th rally in Rio was meant to be one of several such rallies across the nation. An estimated 150,000 people met Django and his heavily armed military guards in the Plaza de Hemfuga to hear their president announce, in his words, quote, the path of great structural reforms. During the rally, President Goulart publicly signed new legislation nationalizing privately owned oil refineries and creating a program of agrarian reform. Goulart's opponents and even some of the moderate left interpreted these plans as evidence of the president's capitulating to the radical leftists, and it gave them an opportunity to accuse Goulart's administration of casting aside democratic process, demonstrated by that heavy armed protection at what was a popular rally, and what they perceived as disregard for public property, excuse me, private property. Um, the right, of course, wanted to associate the large reform policies with an attempt to bring about a communist revolution, of cu accusing the president of trying to cubanizar Brazil. As a counter to Goulart's uh, gathering on March 19th, middle class opposition groups in Sao Paulo staged their own rally, comprised mainly of women's religious organizations, which they called the March of the Familia com Deus Pela Liberdade. The, march, the family march with God for liberty and freedom. While claiming to be apolitical, the family march that had an estimated 50,000 participants allowed the opposition to contrast Goulart's policies and his supporters on the one hand with traditional family, moral, and religious values on the other. Again, one week later during Easter weekend, 
Goulart gave public support to an organization of rank and file naval soldiers who had protested for more than a year for better working conditions, for the right to vote, for the right to marry. And when a prominent leader of that naval union was arrested, the president dismissed the Minister of the Navy. This action gave high-ranking generals space to argue that the president had crossed the line between legality and illegality by disregarding that principle of military discipline and military hierarchy. The generals could now spin their mobilization against the president as a last-ditch effort to save Brazil's democracy from the threat of communism and to protect the rule of law. They set plans to depose Goulart immediately, which they achieved before the end of the week. The generals, as we now set about constructing a new type of regime, a bureaucratic national security state that became a model for um, their southern home neighbors shortly thereafter. The slogan of the National Intelligence Service sums up their public uh, image very nicely. And this is the slogan, quote, the 1964 revolution is irreversible and will consolidate democracy in Brazil. Through the years, the state continued to characterize the coup as a popular revolution, a revolution of the people, carried out only with the assistance of the Brazilian military. In fact, the architects of the dictatorship kept the illusion of democratic governance in place. The initial ruling junta gave way to a succession of military presidents ratified by a Congress composed of one pro-government party and one kind of catch-all opposition party. The claim of democracy and popular revolution, of course, thinly veiled a progressively authoritarian regime that eliminated uh, civil rights, crushed the opposition, censored dissent, and gave wide birth to the abuse of human rights. A series of institutional acts, of course, codified these into law, and the first of which was ratified within days of the coup. The interrogations, the arrests, the murders, and the exiles began immediately as well. They began with the rural labor leaders, the leftist politicians, the scholars, the artists, the journalists, and the students. <coughs> Beyond this sector, from the bottom up, right, those who had the most to gain from structural reform were silenced unable to organize or to voice the reality of their declining standard of living, even in the years when Brazil's economy soared. So in sum, though, my point is that those first 48 hours between March 31st and April 1st of 1964 marked the beginning, only the opening hours of a much more serious drama and a much more serious trauma for Brazilian citizens, for the Brazilian state, and for Brazil's national identity. They were two outlier days that marked the beginning of two decades, in fact, of violence, repression, and closed politics. successful, although persistent outsider in the race for a well-lighted position in the global arena, Brazil, país do futuro sempre adiado, Brazil, the, the country of the future, always postponed, sounds today outdated. While media spread the word about Brazilian economic triumph predicting its key role in the near future of the world's economy, Brazil is giving an interesting connotation to the world future, linking it to its national sociopolitical recent past. In the moment of its economic rising, Brazil, Brazil is in fact reconnecting with its unsolved, suspended traumatic events. Acts of obstinate, obstinate memory, using an expression by Patricio Guzman, the Chilean director, are pervading the political and cultural establishment of the country, going back to the decades of the military dictatorship, 64 to uh, 85, following the past of the countries of Chile, Uruguay, and Argentina. President Dilma Rousseff put great emphasis on the word waiting in a 2011 interview with Newsweek, semi-seriously titled, Don't Mess with Dilma. 
a former activist in the Val Palmares group fighting against Brazilian dictatorship in the late 60s and victim of a three year uh, imprisonment involving torture and electroshocks, President Rousseff explained how, and I'm quoting from the interview with her, in jail you learn to survive, but also that you can't solve your problems overnight. In prison you do a lot of waiting. Waiting necessarily means hope. And if you lose hope, fear takes over. I learned how to wait. End of the quote. Before Rousseff's election in 2011, Brazil had already started to remember. In 2001, the Brazilian government recognized the crimes perpetrated during the years of military dictatorship, which were collectively labeled as acts of state terrorism, terrorism Gustav, by the Supreme Federal Tribunal Court. Victims of torture and rape and relatives of assassinated people started to receive monetary compensation for their unquantifiable loss. In 2010, Brazil was condemned by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for the unpunished death or disappearance of 62 people of the Araguaia River guerrilla between 73 and 74. According to the Attorney General Marlo Alberto Weicher, Procurador da Republica, Amnesty of, amnesty of violations of human rights is always inadmissible. In the last couple of years, the involvement of President Rousseff with the anti-dictatorship organizations in her personal wounds have thrown light on the necessity of criminal justice for the victims of abuse by the state. On 21st September 2011, the constitution of a national truth commission, Comissão Nacional da Verdade, was approved by the Chamber of Deputies. The seven members of this commission are presently conducting a short-term investigation of original files and secret documents in order to clarify responsibilities of state crimes and publish lists with the names of torturers. The final report of this commission will be submitted in December 2014, so the commission had really short time to investigate. Right. Um, it's important to remember some recent discoveries by this truth commission. For instance, uh, before, uh, before 2012, uh, we always thought that torture started in Brazil uh, since 1968, right? This truth commission just found out and disclosed that uh, it's from the very start of the dictatorship period, 64, that torture uh, was, uh, was, uh, was used by military forces. As Professor Letizia Mala recognized in her volume Literatura di Sidenza Politica, 2006, I'm quoting from the book, the political history of this period starts in Britain in the divulge to the population. In the agenda, there are micro-histories which will help professional historians to elaborate the macro-history of the last Brazilian dictatorship, those of the, polit the political desaparecidos and of the archives of the DOPSI, Department of Political and Social Order. It is urgent to write the cultural and literary history of this period, or to systematically gather everything that has been written at last, end of the quote. Media start to inform the Brazilian population about the existence of the National Truth Commission and its aims. The reportage, uh, Crimes da Dittatura, Camino da Reportage, was aired on February 8, 2012 on the public broadcasting television TV Brazil. To elucidate, to reveal, passar al info, are the expressions used in the documentary. Through original footage of violent repressions of public marches, interviews conducted with historians, relatives of desaparecidos and victims of physical violence, the reportage aims to present a chapter of oral history, to work with those micro-histories which will hopefully recompose the big picture of the dictatorship. Space is also given to the embarrassing defense of the 1979 amnesty law by General Luis Eduardo Chapai, but for whom, and I'm quoting from uh, an interview with him, o torturador e o terrorista ambos são criminosos. The torturer and the terrorist are both criminals. And he goes, uh, he, he tells also, what I defend is that there was an amnesty and that amnesty should be respected. It, of course, is a very problematic uh, statement. The situation in Brazil is then compared with that of Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile, and with their ongoing efforts to reestablish dignity to the victims of torture. The last segment of this reportage focuses on several recently born projects for the preservation of traumatic memory. Where we are informed, for instance, that the so-called Casa da Marci, House of Death, 
fear of infamous political homicides perpetrated by the military forces in the metropolis uh, will become a museum under the guidance of the Central Defense of the Regimes. In Sao Paulo, it is already possible to visit the Memorial de Resistencia, a former political prison. Here, in this uh, location, the Memorial de Resistencia, all the recordings of the voices of seven prisoners tell the tale, their daily life, the fears, and the act of solidarity uh, among prisoners. Brazilian filmmakers are also contributing to the act of remembering. The movie Baptismo de Sangue by Alessio Raton, 2006, evokes the collaboration between a group of Dominican priests of Sao Paulo and the guerrilla group Ação Libertador Nacional guided by Carlos Marighella. The movie depicts very graphically and explicitly the acts of torture committed by the militaries against the priests in order to obtain information on Marighella's organization. Uh, it is known that Brazilian military forces implemented hundreds, probably 300 different uh, ways uh, of torturing prisoners. 2006 is also the years of the biopic Zuzu Anjo, movie by Sergio Rezenji about the autonomous fashion designer whose son, Stuart, a political activist, was killed by agents in 1970. The documentary Vlad, 30 years later, by João Batista de Andrade, from 2005, investigates the fake staged suicide of the famous journalist Vladimir Herzog. In recent years, fiction has been accompanied by scholarly research in the National Archives as well. The urgency for the study of these materials was advertised by a series of TV ads called Abaixo Sinado, and interpreted by popular Brazilian actors who, in a sort of spoon river way, give voice to the desaparecidos. Among these uh, participants are famous uh, act Brazilian actors like uh, Fernando Montenegro, for instance. Groups of research have been established in different regions and cities of Brazil. One of these is located, for instance, in Belo Horizonte at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. The importance of establishing a network among all of these research groups working in the nation is underlined by Professor Luisa Starling, who speaks of a fragmented memory which needs to be collected and made physically and digitally available to citizens. And there is, uh, for instance, a website that I suggest to, to see. It's called Armazem Memoria, where you can find, it's a digital archive where you can find 17,000 actual doc, original documents of this period related to the state crimes. In the last decade, the attention of many researchers focused on the files written by censorship, by censors. Books, newspapers, magazines, movies, plays, TV shows, but also services, athletic events, etc., were judged by commissions of censors whose aim was to preserve the spirit against preserve the spirit against pernicious influences of, for the moral and intellectual development, as described in the Korean Fagundes book, Censura Libertad Expression sort of a manual for the perfect censor. Another censor of the time, his name is Emleto Caprilioni Filho, defended that censorships are activities as healthy measures for the nation because, and I'm quoting from him, our country is like a continent. What is good for Sao Paulo is not good for the north or the, in the northeast, nor for the south. End of the quote. According to João Ernesto Coelho Neto, who worked as a censor also in Sao Paulo, Censors did not have a cultural or academic background. They were policemen, policemen better remunerated than their colleagues. Scholar Christina Costa conducted research on the censorship in theater through, their through the study of numerous files collected in the Archivo Miruel Silvera, now also available online. Author of the volumes Censura e Sena, the Arte Censura in Brazil, published in 2006, and Censura de Pressão e Resistência no Teatro Brasileiro, 2008, Cristina Costa explains how the DOPSI, the organ of censorship, did not follow a specific set of rules uh, on what had to be considered moral in the, in the arts, but was subjected to negotiations, interference, interferences, political pressures. In particular, the Archivo Miguel Silvera reveals the enthusiastic approval of censorship by institutions related to the Catholic Church. Which were the guiding criteria for these uh, censors? Uh, well, moral, of course. Uh, for instance, the representation of adultery, particularly the adultery by a woman, was always forbidden in, in movies. Uh, political, for instance, the references to communism, communism were also uh, censored. Uh, religious, social, 
uh, for instance, the issues related to racism and homophobia were also, and xenophobia as well, were, were not permitted in the movies of the period. The, period. the Arquivo Nacional de Brasilia uh, contains around 17 million pages of documents still to be uh, disclosed. A vast section of this material relates to movie censorship. Uh, there is a Brazilian researcher, uh, Leonor Sousa Pinto, who dedicated several years of research reading these materials uh, about movies and censorship. Uh, and she, in, 2000 and, uh, in, uh, in 2000, she made available all this material online as well. There is a website that I also suggested to, to look. It's called Memoria da Censura no Cinema Nato Brasileiro, and uh, which has PDFs of uh, thousands of them, original <coughs> documents. The website is also very user-friendly. Uh, once we select a specific movie in the list, we have access to three types of documents, censors, document commentaries, newspapers, reviews, and the file of the Deus archive. Movies that nowadays are considered classics of Brazilian cinema were subjected to a bigoted, blind, moralistic filter, but also to a curious film editing expertise. A classic like the Deus of Diablo and Tell of the Soul um, is unnecessarily long for the censors and needs better editing, according to one censor. This collection of censored notes and forms frequently produce, produces involuntary comic effects as well. Uh, the sexy movie, Donna Flor e Seus Dois Maridos, has moralistic effects, according to Cleusa Via Cabral. Because sex is considered between a wife and a husband, even if the second is a ghost. <laughs> the scene of sodomy is definitely to be cut, though. The plot of Coisas Eroticas, Erotic Things, is difficult to follow. Due to, to, due to its structural, structural fragility. The horror B movie, Amia Noice Levare a Sua Arma by Coffee and Joe, Zedu Caixão, offer, offers an excellent performance by its leading actor, according to another censor. And whoever knows this movie and Coffee and Joe, uh, Joe knows how, I mean, how, how this comment may result as funny, because it's a very bad movie, so it's very weird to. Uh, to um, to recognize the excellence of performance of Coffee during this movie. One obvious taboo subject for the censor was the depiction of homosexuality. Uh, an example, a movie called The Machoins, the original title is Bistonet, as by Reginaldo Farias, it's a movie of 72, a uh, story of three men disguised as, fem as female hairdressers in order to achieve the company of women, was also accepted. This movie was accepted by the censors, considering that the director explores an abnormality homosexuality without praising it. So this was a good point for them. The movie continues the censor with so Garcia is never apologetic of homosexuality. On the contrary, it mocks it. So permitted. Uh, the movie Uvision was filed by Bruno Barreto, 80, 1980, an adaptation of the anonymous play by Nelson Rodriguez, a bleak story of a closeted gay man ending with a homicide scene. A father in law, secret in law with his son in law, shot him at the end. It was considered acceptable as well for an adult audience. Um, the website Memoria da Censura no Cinema Brasileiro excellently demonstrates the synchronic correspondence of intents shared by contemporary Brazilian politics and binational academic scholarship. The country of the future, now finally achieving the actual realization of its potential, is more than ever. Uh, more than ever ready to affirm the relevance of the preservation of this troubled past. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Toto and, uh, and Dr. Gavioli for that uh, historical and literary context <laughs> for the COVID. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions and discussions after our keynote speaker, and we look forward to that. Let me now introduce our keynote speaker for this, <coughs> for this event, um, Dr. Robert Moser. Thank you, first of all, for coming and attending and joining us. Um, Dr. Moser is, as, as some of you may, may, may know, is a very prolific uh, author. Uh, he has published uh, numbers of, a number of uh, articles and journals and edited volumes. Uh, much of his work is on um, figures of the dead. I'm not sure if there's a 
parallel comparison to the 1964 event, but that, I think that could be interesting. He's, as I said, the author of several works, and I'll mention a few, the, the Carnivalesque, the Defunto of the Death and, and, and the Dead in Modern Literature, which was published in 2008. Uh, and more recently, in 2009, he's the editor of an anthology on Luso American literature writings by Portuguese speaking authors in North America, as I mentioned, uh, published in 2011. He uh, is, uh, does work and has conducted and teaches uh, novels, short stories, poetry, chronicas, uh, etc. But again, with a, a special focus on the expressions of haunting in the morning in Luso Brazilian literature. Dr. Moser is an associate professor of Portuguese, Brazilian, and African literature and culture at the University of Georgia. And once again, Dr. Moser, thank you for joining us and participating in this in this event. Please help me welcome Dr. Robert. Moser.